In my Things You Missed episodes on the Final Destination franchise, I've pointed out some of the hidden signs of impending disaster. In Final Destination 5, this caution sign can be seen ahead of the bridge, and what looks like a simple peeling of plastic from wear and tear is actually a warning of the Titanic bridge collapse that would follow. As usual, there would be connections to the disaster that the franchise is based around, the crash of Flight 180. The bus that they're on is called Roland Coach Lines. Roland is a French name. That's a French name! And the logo features a bird feather, a reference to flights, and the memorial of the Flight 180 crash. The video that plays inside the bus is from 180 Corporate Consulting, and the bus number is 1282, the sum of whose digits add up to 13, the unlucky number that we've seen arise in every Final Destination movie. The main character, Sam, also known as Nick 2.0, sees a vehicle labeled Taggart Logging Truck Number 2. Taggart is a reference to the Taggart Theater, an accident location in the fourth movie, and Number 2 is a reference to Final Destination 2, which notably had a huge accident involving a logging truck just like this one. And the license plate of this Chevrolet matches Carter Horton's car that gets destroyed in the first movie. Then there's Nathan's line about his employee, Roy, which is another possible death omen. But I want him over, even if it kills me. To learn all of FD5 secrets, including the clues about the movie's twist ending, stick around to the end of this video. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Oh my, sound the alarm, alert the media, because CZ is actually finishing a movie franchise he started on Things You Missed. I've got to make sure that YouTube comes down to tape this. The fifth and final of the original triannual Final Destination movies was directed by Stephen Quayle, whose last name sounds like a combination of quesadilla and something you would put on your salad. This is why I should never write these episodes when I'm hungry. Let's get into the things you missed. The story begins outside the offices of Presage Paper. The word Presage is no accident. It's defined as a sign or warning that something, typically something bad, will happen. It's also probably no mistake that this is a paper company, because the boss of Presage Paper, a man named Dennis Lapman, is played by actor David Kochner, who many will recognize from his role at the time in the US television sitcom The Office, where he plays Todd Packer, who is pretty much the same character as Dennis. You're welcome. Merry Christmas! Oh, wait! Oh, you're kidding me! Packer! Yes! He also seems to have bought himself an Exec of the Year mug, much like how Michael Scott has a mug that says World's Best Boss in the office. The license plates also tell us that we're back in New York, where Final Destinations 1 and 2 took place. Sam and his girlfriend Molly are having some relationship issues. Molly, your ticket's canceled. Tell me that's a mistake. I was gonna tell you after this weekend. It's not working out, Sam. Well, that was a waste of a travel ticket. If you've seen my previous episodes on the other movies, you know the drill. Luck, chance, and fate are always referenced in these movies because being caught in a disaster is seen as bad luck, and many of the victims are superstitious. Candace has a pair of lucky rubber bands. Oh, it's sad. It's just something I do to relax me. And for luck. And it snaps right before her accident. The news station that reports on the bridge collapse is on Channel 13, The Unlucky Number. The survivors are referred to as the Lucky Eight. And although they've been branded the Lucky Eight, though eight is usually not considered a lucky number, as Bradley Donovan can probably attest to, Isaac steals a gift certificate for Ming Yun Spa. Ming Yun is the concept of personal life and destiny in Chinese folklore. And before his treatment, he rubs the Buddha statue's belly, which is also seen as an omen of good luck. Ironically, it's that same statue that winds up being the end of him. Olivia also taints her own fortune shortly before her demise by knocking over a picture frame on her desk. More on that later. The coach bus comes up onto the North Bay Bridge, and we we can see that it's a long way down to the surface. Computer generated and animated water. Final Destination 5 also brings back the concept of a recurring death omen song, Dust in the Wind by Kansas. This may be a reference to the tendency of death to materialize in the form of a gust of wind. We've seen the winds of death in relation to many of the accidents, but perhaps none more than the bridge collapse, which was said to be the result of high winds and structural damage caused by the construction. We're chalking up the high winds and structural damage from the road construction. I win. In the scene where the bridge gives way, there are many undetected clues about how each survivor would meet their fate. For example, Isaac dies while laying on his stomach in the premonition, and he would be in the same position at the massage place when death catches up with him. Olivia's fate is essentially sealed once she loses her glasses in the vision, a clue about her real final moments, which are spent in a procedure to correct her vision. The premonition shows her surviving the bridge fall, but ultimately being done in when a car falls on her. Her actual doom is the opposite. After her eye is mutilated by the laser, she does her best Aunt Maggie 
buggy and falls down several stories onto a car. Several characters have to make their way across a steel beam to get to safety, a foreshadowing of the balance beam accident that ultimately got Candace bent over backwards. In the vision, Candace does fall to her death, which she technically does in the gym as well. Peter gets impaled by stakes, just as he is when Sam skewers him a la carte, and Sam is chopped in half, much like what happens to Molly when she's dissected by the wing of the airplane. Nathan's death isn't really foreshadowed in the vision, but there would be a very interesting secret hidden in one of his time cards. The holiday season has arrived, and you know what that means. Well, if you're like me, it means horror movies just like all the other months of the year. And when you're watching a lot of horror movies, you may start to exhaust the selection of your streaming service of choice. What if you could unlock a bunch of new movies just by clicking a button? With NordVPN, you can do that. I'm gonna use Netflix as an example. Right now, I'm in the US of A. Literally trapped here, no other country will accept me. Now, with one click, I'll change my location. Let's do France in honor of Final Destination. Look, now we've got all the movies the French people can see. You can keep doing this for all the other countries, or you can look up which country you need to set it to to see a specific movie. Movie. Of course, that's just a benefit of NordVPN. The main point is to encrypt your web traffic so that nobody knows about the data that you're sending or accessing online. Now, as a CZ's world viewer, you're going to be getting a special holiday deal where you get a two-year plan with four additional months free. Just go to nordvpn.com slash CZ's world and use coupon code CZ's world at checkout. The news reports that Presage Paper has eight survivors, but the other 17 employees perished in the collapse. There must have been some people stowed underneath because I do not recall seeing 23 people on that bus. Surprisingly, this movie doesn't really keep up with the tradition of the names of the deceased being the names of the crew members on the movie. Only one of the last names matches a name in the credits, and Johnson is one of the more common American names. There are two graves in the background that correspond to the names of previous Final Destination characters. Carpenter could be to represent Nora and Tim Carpenter from Final Destination 2, and Clark was one of the police officers from Final Destination 3, although these can't actually be their tombstones because those characters haven't died yet. While the crew reference easter eggs tradition may have been let go, the tradition of something wildly inappropriate happening at every funeral goes on strong. Or Isaac Palmer. Did he just say my name? That's not funny. The people were the I just came here with tragedies. I'm so we're not less of a family. I see dead we're less people. Of a <laughs> This is, of course, a reference to the iconic line from The Sixth Sense. I see dead people. If you like references to freaking great 90s movies, this is the entry for you, because another can be seen later at the office in the form of these cubicle sticky notes spelling out, always be closing. The iconic sales mantra from Glengarry Glen Ross. A, B, C. A, always, B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Of course, the final chapter of the original pentology of Final Destination would contain a fair share of references to the other films. When Sam visits Molly, she's boiling water, which was part of Valerie Luton's death in the first one. In the gymnastics scene, a potentially electronically charged puddle creeps towards Candace's foot, like the puddle in Todd Wagner's bathroom. Sam's cubicle has a toy motorcycle, similar to Eugene's motorcycle in FD2. The motto, Born to Ride, references the opening of each movie, which all feature disasters of a ride of some kind, and Isaac flirts with a girl on the phone named Kimber. Tell me it's the Kimber from last Tuesday. This could have maybe been Kimberly Corman from Final Destination 2. Also, this has nothing to do with the story at all, but did anyone notice as Sam is getting out of work, there's this truck just completely bastardizing the parking job? I mean, the person is almost completely up on the curb. What the hell? Speaking of hell, there are usually a lot of references to hell or the devil in relation to the deaths. I think there's only one new one in this movie. It comes when the rogue factory guy, Roy, fails to take Mr. Crab's warning into account. and gets himself Bobby Dagand right through the skull. The end of <laughs> pokes through the top of his skull like a devil's horn. After seeing this, Peter is very, shall we say, curious about the circumstances of the accident. Did you or didn't you? Hey, Peter, calm down. Did you or didn't you? Did you or didn't you? Did you or didn't you? I think I did. I never understood why he would say that. Anyway, the first tragedy after escaping the bridge is Candace's gymnastics mishap. She speaks with her boyfriend before going on and walks out from section 108 in the stands, an anagram of the cursed flight number 180. Earlier I mentioned the wind being a symbol that death is among the characters, and we've seen it in many forms in the series, starting with the fan in Alex Browning's bedroom. In the gymnastics scene, we see a fan brought in because the air conditioning is broken, and it contributes to taking out Candace. Another bad sign that can be found in the scene is an AC plug, which looks kind of like a skull. 
goal. The ambulance that shows up is U1575. U is the 21st letter of the alphabet, so if you add that to the other digits, 1 plus 5 plus 7 plus 5, you get 39, which matches the amount of Mount Abraham High School students who pass away on Flight 180. The next day at the office, not that the office, some of the remaining presage employees return to work. In each movie, I've mentioned how the character names correspond with filmmakers who had an impact on the horror genre. It is here that we find out about a few more. Olivia Castle is named after the great William Castle, Peter Friedkin is named after the great William Friedkin, and Candace Hooper after the great Toby Hooper. Olivia's eye doctor is named Dr. Leonetti. This may be a reference to John Leonetti, a notable horror movie cinematographer that would go on to direct five horror films in a row after this. Isaac Palmer is named after Betsy Palmer, who is probably most most well known as Pamela Voorhees. Isaac does some snooping around the office and steals a gift certificate from his late coworker. The expiration date is 63001. If we multiply 6 times 30 times 1, we get the number that's come up time and time again. 179. I'm just kidding, it's 180. This certificate number also ends in 810, which is an anagram of 180. Isaac hurts his finger while retrieving it, just as Sam did on the bus and on the plane, meaning that this would be a sign that Isaac's hours are numbered. Nathan brings up a case of adult beverages. If you've watched my other Final Destination videos, you already know it's coming. It's a six-pack of Heist Pale Ale, the fizzy but fatal refreshment that foreshadowed disasters in the last three Final Destination movies. But The Office would contain another important Final Destination callback. FD5 lacks the volume of crew reference easter eggs that the other movies have, but I did spot one more in the presage office. In Olivia's work area, there's a memorandum to the board of directors from Adrian Reitzak. He is Final Destination 5's graphic designer. I already mentioned Olivia's broken picture frame, but what I didn't bring up is the photo itself. It's a ride photo from Devil's Flight, a roller coaster that would crash five years later during the events of Final Destination 3. They claim it's the world's scariest roller coaster. The movie is set in 2000, about two weeks before Millennium Force would open, but I'd still probably give it to oblivion at that point in time. The next death is Isaac's at the massage place. Yum yum dim sum. And the only other thing that I'll say about this is that the no cell phone sign seen in the lobby may count as an actual warning from death, considering that his phone is actually what causes the fire. After that is Olivia at the Eastfield Laser Eye Center, and her sign comes when she's squeezing the teddy bear for comfort and its eye pops off. The same happens to her not long after. Out of every scene in the franchise, I think this is the fatality that affected me the most. Sam recalls his vision to try to remember the order that they were supposed to die in, where we see probably my favorite part. Why do they do that? Don't they know that slowing stuff down makes it funny? The next death is supposed to be Nathan, who's still having problems with an employee named Roy. He does a little snooping using security camera 32, the reverse of 23, as in Route 23. Also, just gotta say, for a security camera, that definition is f***ing incredible. I mean, look at that. Most security cameras, you can barely even see FaZe Bank's bald spot. But on this thing, you can zoom right into the hairs on Roy's chin. I gotta get me a camera like that. The DX8100. Probably another anagram of the flight number, 180. With an extra zero tacked on. The finale involves Peter coming into the restaurant that Sam works at to take Molly's life so he can theoretically add her years to his own. Now don't get me wrong, I love this scene. It's very satisfying to have an actual antagonist after nearly five movies. I just think the way he goes about it is kind of hilarious. He just invites himself in, pours himself a huge glass of wine, and then goes all Badlands chugs on it. And then Peter chases them into the kitchen, and... Wait, wait, why is he turning on the fryers? Is he planning on deep frying Molly? This is gonna be the best kill ever. <laughs> Do it, do it. As you may know, two thirds of all Final Destination deaths involve water or liquid. I think this comment on my FD4 episode puts it best. Water is the source of life on this planet. Without liquid water, we would not be here. It is fitting that a liquid starts all of the death. The movie started when the North Bay Bridge collapsed into the water. Candace's final college practice would become her final ever practice, thanks in part to the dripping water from the air conditioner. Isaac didn't exactly get his happy ending massage because the bottle of disinfectant alcohol falls, starting a typical Final Destination flammable liquid incident, Olivia's fun and games end when her water, or rather, her woda, spills onto the outlet, causing the laser surgery machine to malfunction. Sam and Molly's plane crashes into the Atlantic Ocean, and Nathan meets his fate at a bar. Of course, whenever I talk about Final Destination 5, people tell me that they were blown away by that twist ending. 
Pun slightly intended. Five was actually my first Final Destination movie because my friends told me you don't have to watch them in order. Liars! So I had no idea what was going on when they boarded Flight 180 at the end, and I was kind of pissed when I found out that it was ruined for me just so we could watch that movie that night. But upon rewatching, I noticed at least nine different signs, some of which may be kind of obvious, that Final Destination 5 was in fact a prequel, not a sequel. I'll start with the opening credits. They contain a montage of other disasters we've seen in the franchise, and when Flight 180 blows up, it emits this metal beam in a V shape. V is the Roman numeral for 5. Final Destination 5 would contain Flight 180. We've also got to take into account the title of the last movie. It would be a bit strange to make a movie called The Final Destination, only to follow it up with a sequel a few years later. However, making FD5 a prequel allows The Final Destination to remain The Final Destination chronologically. Sam is an aspiring chef, and the next clue comes when he reveals that his restaurant wants to send him to an apprenticeship in Paris. They want to send me to the flagship restaurant in Paris for who knows how long. Flight 180 was a trip to Paris, France. The restaurant that he works for is Le Café Miro 81. This is the very same name as the restaurant whose dislodged sign took out Carter Horton at the end of the first Final Destination. Had he ever made it to that job, he would have been working at that very same restaurant. Then there's the return of William Bloodworth. I went into more detail on this on my horror history episode on Bloodworth, but basically he stopped showing up after Final Destination 2, so his presence may suggest that we're actually in the past. More evidence that we're at the dawn of a new millennium can be found in the gymnasium at Westdale College, where recent-looking championship banners are hanging from 1994 and 1998, but nothing past the year 2000. Then in the office, there are a couple of clues. The first is more of a bad omen. A miniature model of the Voule aircraft can be seen sitting on the cubicle walls, and when Isaac steals Robert's spa certificate, the expiration date can clearly be seen, and it's in 2001. And then when he tries to use it, it works, implying that 2001 has not yet arrived. Later on in Nathan's office, we see the actual date, as he's collecting time cards for the week ending in April 30th, 2000. This is just two weeks before the date of the Voli Flight 180 crash, which took place on May 13th, 2000 in the sequel universe. As I've discussed before, there are two continuities. In the original, the crash takes place in 1999, and in all the sequels, it takes place in 2000. Oh God, I have thought a lot about that somewhere, Alex. It exists, that place. So, the day of the flight arrives, and Sam and Molly take their seats in row 23. There's that number from FD2 again. I did go back to the first movie to see if the people sitting in those seats resembled Sam and Molly at all. They don't. There's a brown-haired man in Molly's seat and a brunette woman in Sam's. Which begs the question, why don't they just cast characters who look like these rather than cast someone who looks exactly like Nick from the last movie? None of the other passengers resemble the passengers from the original Flight 180. For example, this is where Billy Hitchcock should be. Actually, there are a lot of inconsistencies, like how the plane is now one row shorter than it was in the first movie. Or how the gate number on Sam's travel ticket is H6, but we clearly see it's gate 46 in the first movie. He's seated in 23J. According to the way that the seats were mapped in the original, he should have actually been 23B. These could be mistakes, and they may be, but these small changes can be explained away with the idea that the sequel universe changes little details from the original. The final signs for Sam come too late. He once again hears the Death Omen song from the opening, Dust in the Wind, and Molly's magazine has an ad for Eastfield Laser Eye Center where Olivia died. You'd think the ensuing malpractice suit might have gotten them shut down. The final scene shows the final survivor, Nathan, attending a memorial for Roy. Dust in the Wind can be heard playing in the background. And in one of the photos in the shrine, we see that Roy is a fan of the race car number 6, the car that causes the big speedway accident in Final Destination 4. There's another FD4 reference when this guy tells Nathan that Roy didn't have long to live anyway. Life's we saw this same phrase on the back of someone's shirt at the racetrack. Finally, before the franchise would be laid to rest for the next decade, they just had to squeeze one more Heist Pale Ale logo. There has been a lot of talk of a Final Destination 6, and I'm going to be doing a video breaking down the possibilities for that new sequel. So make sure you're subscribed to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring the death bell for notifications, and I will see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive. If you want to beat death, use a face mask and social distancing.